it's Teardown Tuesday. So let's take a look at uh, what we've got to uh, tear down today. It's Tear Down Tuesday, and I have a bag full of security crap that we're going to take a look at. This was uh, a job that I did where I was removing the old equipment from another provider and switching them over. So this stuff is all going to be recycled because it's not compatible with the, the system that we use. So I figured I'd take a look at the competitor's devices and see that there actually may be some pieces, some parts on here that might be usable for something else. So what I got today was four door window switches, a flood detector, two motion detectors, and this one is a combination smoke and CO detector. And these all operate on batteries. As you can see, this was not even that old. It expires July 2029. So this one here, you know, it was only probably a couple of years old, but the, the customer that had it installed by another company, or actually it wasn't, it was the new homeowner that bought the house. This was installed by a, another company in the previous uh, homeowner's home. And when the house sold, all this stuff was left behind and uh, they had no way of using it because they didn't have passwords or anything to control the panel. And because it was with a different company, the equipment was just removed and recycled. And the panel was actually left at the house because it was mounted on the wall. So we didn't take the panel off, otherwise it would have been a hole in the wall where the panel was. Um, but the, the sensors were all swapped out. Anyway, um, first things first, Here's uh, this one here is a flood detector. The, the actual flood detector was on here. And if we take a look at the, the actual circuitry on this, these were all powered by uh, lithium batteries, which uh, are getting a, a second lease on life because I think I put them in this one, did I? Or not? Yep, here they are. So, you know, my through night flashlights that take this 16550 battery will also take two of these. So I ended up with a pile of, of used batteries because I think I ended up with about nine batteries because, like, this thing takes four, right? So there's nine batteries total. Anyway, um, flashlight like this, these batteries are all in various states of charge. They're not full. Most of them are measuring up around 2.9 uh, volts, but uh, there's plenty of life left in them to use in my flashlights and, uh, you know, put them, into, put them to use. Anyway, uh, here's here's the, uh, this is a water detector, and basically, I think these will probably will end up being very, very similar in design. So they are the same. The only difference is, uh, looks like the only difference is, instead of having the read switch for the magnetic contact, it, it just has the terminals here. See, the mag you can put an external magnetic contact on them as well. This one here even has the same position for soldering across the reed switch. So they're the same sensors. They're the, the same circuit board, looks like. Should be able to, yeah, they are. They're exactly the same. If we look on the back side of them here, right, they're exactly the same. Oh, this one here has got an encapsulated uh, IC, whereas this one does not. Probably because the the door window switches are designed so they can be put on an exterior door and if it was in a say a, an unheated garage or, or something it's possible that moisture could you know build up and damage so maybe that's why they've encapsulated the ICs on the door window switches as if we look at them all these ones all appear to be encapsulated but the flood sensor is not it's the same it's the same unit exactly but as you can see the the IC on the flood sensor is not encapsulated Probably because this is deemed that this is going to be in a house, like in a basement somewhere, and it's being used to detect if a, uh, a sump is overflowing or if a water heater is burst. Um, these these wires go to a, a sensor, which is basically just two terminals that would sit on the floor, and if water were to come into contact with both of them, it creates an electrical current between the two of them, which triggers the alarm. They all have a button on here. This is the tamper sensor. 
That's what these are all here for. So if someone rips a, a, a sensor off, it will immediately send an alert. And of course, these ones have a read switch. I'm thinking that there may be some components that I might want to keep off of these, uh, namely the read switch, which could certainly be removed and reused. And I'm also thinking the little, little lever switch here, because this could be useful in other projects. So what I'm going to do before I dispose of these is I'm going to actually remove the switch, keep it, and remove the the little read switch because those are always uh, pieces that can be reused. I don't think the, the little push button switch here, maybe we'll remove this too anyway. Yeah, this must be, this board is, this is there must be a, a plating through here for ground or something because I can put a lot of heat into this thing and it's just not budging. The same with the switch. I try to take the switch out. Um, there must be in multiple layers in here on this board, whereas this one here is just connected to one side or the other. You can see how thick this board is. It is a multi-layer board. It looks to be maybe a four-layer board. Why they would make a board this thick for a sensor like this, but uh, I guess there's stuff that's going on on internal layers. Anyway, it might be just as easy to just to uh, take these three switches out or cut them if I want to keep them because they're so fragile. You know, you, you put heat on them to uh, remove them. Maybe put some more solder on here and see whether that will help remove it. I mean, I got this thing hot as anything, and it's not budging. Oh, there we go. Okay, we got that one out. Straighten the pins by just using my pliers to kind of straighten them. Because you don't want to put any stress on, or it'll break the glass. So now if I bring a magnet such as the one that's attached to the side of my screwdriver. If I bring a magnet in there, you can see that proximity-wise, just the magnetic force getting close to within like an inch will cause the switch to close. And that's how, that's how magnetic contacts for burglar alarms work is on one side of the door you'll have a magnetic contact and the other side of the door there's a read switch and as long as the door is closed there's continuity and as soon as the door opens the connection is broken and that is uh, how these things operate anyway it's always nice to have a, a couple of these things kicking around for projects like for for detectors to detect if a door is open or closed Always nice to have a couple of those kicking around, so I'll, I'll hang on to the uh, read switches off of these sensors. The ones I can get out without breaking, as I did on this one. As you can see, the glass broke. See the two pieces there? If I bring a magnet near them, we might even be able to see them move. Next, we're going to open up the the PIR detectors. I think they probably just release like that. There's the PIR detector. Again, not rocket science. You've got a lens on the front here. The lens has a texture to it. So normally your sensor is sitting in here kind of like this. It's looking through this window. And what the window has, if we look on the back side of the window, the front side of the window is completely smooth, but the back side of the window has a series of ridges. And what these ridges do is as a heat source moves across the field of view, these ridges cause the heat signature to flash. You've got all these ridges down here. This is for the lower field. This is for the higher field of view. So that the, the 
infrared detector looks out pretty much in a straight line and it looks down right so that it can detect and the so it can detect movement along the ground and the way that these ridges are are uh, scaled like this as you can see the the lenses gets bigger as we get down lower to the ground this is so that small pets don't tend to trigger the alarm because they, 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 they take longer to cross from one zone to the next but a large person trying to crawl on the ground for example will intersect these uh, ridges and cause the pulses of light or not light pulses of heat because this is working off uh, radiant heat from your body uh, to reach the sensor cause the temperature change and that's that's how these work is they they're looking at they're looking at the background radiation right there's the sensor there they're looking at the background radiation infrared everything emits an infrared signature whether it's the wall or whether it's the furniture they just pick up heat from the room and they will radiate it but they're not moving they are fixed and what happens when anything that emits heat moves across the, from the field of view on the front it creates a, a waveform that is analyzed in the circuitry so it's not just seeing the pulses of light change but it's analyzing how the frequency changes based on what is generated through this lens it causes the signal level to, to the amplitude to change and it's analyzed and if it detects it what is being detected is uh, what a person moving would generate it then triggers an alarm that's basically how these things operate this is not just a smoke detector this is a combination smoke and carbon monoxide detector and unlike some there's there's two types of uh, of smoke detectors there's the ionizing which have some radioactive material we've looked at those before when I took one of my old ones apart that was not working and got the piezo element working uh, this one's a photoelectric so this will have a photoelectric detection and I've never taken one of these ones apart but this one used four batteries that Torx type looks like it's the standard standard Torx bit that I've got here so let's just open this one up so here's the inside of this unit here and uh, oh look it uses a little speaker cool you can put some music through that and see what that thing sounds like <laughs> I will too I will put some music through that thing that little speaker to see how bad this little speaker sounds but we'll remove the speaker because I'll keep that part this uh, smoke detector probably has a voice announcer that would say like carbon monoxide detected or smoke detected as it's sounding the buzzer I would think that's what the speakers for, for voice prompts neat I wonder how it sounds well we'll find out we'll find out shortly so it's got these two diodes that are just mounted they're probably thermal yeah I bet you they're thermal they're thermal detection so this has got heat detection as well. These were sitting up up here. Like they, they, they went through the, the base here. And those were sitting up in the uh, in the detection area. Interesting. So those would those would be detecting heat. I'm sure that's all these are doing is these are just detecting if there's uh, any excessive heat. Like if there's a fire, for example, and the air is getting hot. We'll put some heat on them and watch what happens. So we've got a voltage drop here. <clears throat> Bring my soldering iron here and I bet this will change. You see, as I have the soldering iron just sitting close to it, I'm not touching. I'm not touching the sensor at all. I'm just bringing it close. But we see the voltage drop going down. So that's what those are. Those are a thermal detector, a solid state thermal detector. They kind of resemble a diode, but you notice that it does not have a stripe on one side indicating a cathode. 
So these two devices are thermal detectors, and they were marked as TH on here for thermal, TH1 and TH2. Thermal detectors, uh, we're going to have a, a couple different sensors on here. This is one of these is going to be the, uh, the CO detector. Caution, contains acid, non-spillable. Made in the UK. This is the uh, CO detector. This one's going to be the photoelectric smoke detector. And how these operate is they shine a light beam from here. They shine a light beam out and detect it on the other side. I wonder if I can uh, power these things up if I put a couple batteries in, whether I can power this thing up and actually uh, see the light coming from it. If we watch, see the light blinking? So that's detecting, and it is infrared because I don't see it. I'm looking down at now. There's no light emitting, but you see it there. So that's basically what happens is uh, the light the light beam is shone into this detection chamber, and uh, if there's smoke present, the smoke comes in through this cap, and the smoke particles will cause the light beam to bounce around, and if the light beam gets received by the other reflector or the other detector. I don't know if my finger in there will do anything. Warning, loud sure noise coming. Blow some smoke in there. It would go off. Ah, look. So yeah, um, that's how they operate. When there's smoke in the air, the smoke causes the light beam that is basically, it's shining up at an angle. Causes the light beam that's shining up at an angle to uh, be reflected back and make it to the detector on the other side, which causes it to go off. I think probably it'll go off if I hold it up like this because the lights in the room would get detected by the detector and cause it to go off. Well, likely, but uh, when I put my hand in there, when I put my finger down there, my finger was now causing a reflection of the light from the infrared emitter to be detected and detected as smoke and cause the alarm to go off. I believe this one was probably a, a, a modular design because as you can see the radio module can be removed so they could have used this basic design in multiple applications for different alarm companies this one was a Honeywell design but they could have put a different radio on there for a different uh, a different company had they wanted anyway it's a ah, it's a kind of a neat little old unit so say this is just going for recycling inside here this is going to be the the CO detector and uh, this is why they have a life a lifetime on them because inside here there's a there's a chemical reaction that takes place and uh, there's an acid inside this thing it even says caution contains acid non-spillable made in the UK is where that's made and where is this made this is Mexico where this uh, unit is uh, assembled or made Anyway, there's the CO detection module. It just unplugs. If we look up the part number that's on here, we'll see that it's an EcoShare 2E CO gas sensor for zero to 500 parts per million. And this is what it is. It says the best value high quality CO sensor on the market and utilized in millions of gas detectors worldwide. Ideal for fire detection, commercial, marine, and residential alarms in, in car park, 
systems. It says available as a single sensor or in combination with a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter as a complete housed solution. It's the latest generation from Sixth Sense. And here's what they say. Exceptionally low cost, unique design for use in extreme environments. Lifetime of six years continuous use, yet they have this thing rated for uh, how long did they say here? This is, uh, this is good till July 2029. We're in 2021. So this thing was in service for a couple of years before I took it down because it certainly wasn't brand new. So they're saying six years and I'm guessing that they're saying 10 on this. This is integrated active filter to eliminate false alarms caused by common household vapors. Available with a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter. So this has got a transmitter inside that transmits, I guess, because it's only got two pins, that would be for the power for this thing. So this would have an integrated circuitry, I'm thinking. And uh, it's, it's sending a signal to the alarm. Oh, 10 year sensor but this is not the one because its part number is 211B3001 and this is a 211B3000 so this is the 6 year one I guess that's the uh, where the gas goes in there's a hole on the top here I don't see any other place though like it's sealed so this unit, it must, uh, I'm thinking it must heat and cool or something to draw, because something's going to draw the air into it, right? There just seems to be one little tiny hole on the top there. And I'm almost, I'm almost tempted to take this thing apart and see what the hell's inside it. What do you think? Should we tear this thing apart? Will the top come off? I mean, the bottom doesn't seem to come off this one. The last one I took apart, the bottom actually came apart on it, but... Uh, it says contains acid, non-spillable. So should I be should I be concerned? Am I into burning a hole in my bench here? I should probably be putting gloves on for this. top should come off and reveal what's inside here. There it goes. I would imagine that's probably where the, the active material is, is inside here. Oh yes, yeah, you can. In this chamber down the bottom. Okay, that's sealed. There's a, a little fine wire here. This would be probably the heating wire right there. It's a fine wire. 
I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a little fine wire here. This would provide the heat necessary to create the reaction. I don't know what's sealed in here. It's sealed in epoxy. But uh, obviously there's got to be a way for this to sense the circuit. Either it's, either it's going to change its resistance or this thing's sending out a signal. There may be some circuitry down below here. I mean, this just looks to be like uh, like a cotton packing that obviously would contain the the reagent, the acid. And then there's this piece on top here, but uh, I, mean, I don't really see anything else inside here. That's a filter. You know, so being careful not to touch the uh, the stuff that's in here because I don't know what it, what what it's got in it. So this contains acid, but what type of acid? Hydrochloric, sulfuric. Who knows? That's a carbon filter. Looks to be. Hmm. So I think that pretty much sums this up. There's not really anything I can use off this. So we're going to throw this back together and send this back for recycling. Want to hear what this thing sounds like? I know you do. Are we ready to hear how bad this sounds? Oh, basically a tweeter. I blow that pretty easily. Oh, it's warming up. It's getting warm even at that volume. Of course, what this speaker was for, this was to produce the annoying sound for um, carbon monoxide. And probably, I think this thing probably spoke to you as well. This alarm probably said, carbon monoxide detected. And that's why it had a speaker in it as opposed to just a piezo buzzer. Anyway. It works. Basically a tweeter. I'm not going to pop this. I could very easily with this amplifier pop this thing, but. You never know what I might need a tweeter for, so I'm not gonna pop it. Because it's a tweeter. Well, come on. As a tweeter, it'll work perfect. So, there we go. Little tweeter. I might need it in a speaker sometime, so I'm going to keep it.